Nicole, it's great to see you here at CES 2024. How have you been? Great, good to see you again, Dan. Yeah, it's good to have you here. It's always good to catch up with you. CES, huge moment in every uh, automaker's uh, world right now. You see pretty much, what, 130,000 people converge, and if not the top thing that people want to see, it's what's going on in automotive. And I would say the trend line, AI, 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 but in automotive, you talk about autonomy, you're talking about you know, infotainment, you're talking about you know, digital cockpit, AI is going to change it all. So this year has to be another big year for Qualcomm. Tell me a little bit about what the company uh, is talking about here this year at CES in terms of automotive. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, CES has been an automotive show for us for a number of years. This year it's Snapdragon digital chassis with the Gen AI twist. That's what you're going to see a lot of. Uh, but no, I think for the company, you know, uh, AI has obviously become very central to a lot of things that are going on, PCs, phones, and absolutely automotive. Uh, you know, we've, we've been on a great journey on the automotive side of the house because uh, we've been building this uh, business, this platform for a number of years. And uh, automotive is, as an industry, going through a fairly uh, complex set of changes because the pace of innovation, especially as you look at how China is moving, especially as you look at how the EV transition is happening, there is just a lot that automakers have to accomplish to be able to be competitive. And for that, they need uh, platforms, they need partners, they need uh, the ability to be able to move fast. And I think we've uh, you know, built a platform that allows them to be able to go do that, and we are seeing that in our uh, numbers, we are seeing that in the wins that we are getting, we are seeing that in the trust that our customers are showing to us. Yeah, so this year you're sitting in the studio with me. Last year uh, we did this interview, we did an interview. It was uh, you and me sat outside of this Snapdragon uh, demo vehicle. Um, very cool, futuristic vehicle. I think uh, you and I have had a chance to sit in it a few times around the world now. We've sat That's here, right. we did it in, um, in Germany, um, right. and every time we sit down, things have proliferated and moved forward a little bit. Yeah. What's kind of progress looking like in this industry, you know, over the last, I feel like about two years ago, you really, uh, two, maybe two and a half, I think you probably say longer, but the last couple of years have been huge for Qualcomm. You saw your design pipeline go from, you know, a little over 10 billion to almost $30 billion. I've seen design wins from just about every major OEM, strength in China, strength here domestically. But what's kind of the, what are the, you know, key technology drivers that are, you know, you say that are creating this momentum and what's kind of happening even in this last year that's really notable? Well, you know, I mean, looking back, it is pretty straightforward and logical, but the strategy that we put out for ourselves was, we are a technology company and we uh, develop a lot of different technologies. Uh, some of these technologies are, uh, are embodied into products that can be used as is by a car. Others need to actually be adapted for the car. So we took a big step back and we said, what's our, what's our starting point? Where do we really need to start? And it all came, came kind of down to, the car is going to change as a platform. It's going to be a mobility platform. It's going to have a lot of different uh, use cases. It's going to be innovated upon by many different uh, customers in various parts of the world. So we have to build something that is very versatile, scales up, still embodies all of the key technology that we have, but it has to be something that has to work for the automotive industry. And there are two things that are very important, safety and quality. And safety and quality, if you don't have that, this is not a business that you really want to be thinking about very seriously. So we made those decisions four or five years ago. And uh, you know, the semiconductor crisis hit, it became very clear to the automakers that uh, they had to make sure they had partners who they could rely on, not, ju not just for technology and support and features, but they are there when they need them. We have prioritized automotive all the way up to the top in terms of uh, which industries we focus on. So today we find ourselves in this situation where we're basically focused on two major areas of uh, differentiation. One is connectivity, the other is compute. And you know, if you think of those two key blocks, uh, computation is becoming key for the car because it is becoming this uh, product that keeps absorbing more and more technology because the use cases are endless. And of course, connectivity is something that you absolutely need. On top of that, we've been building a ton of software. We've been uh, building a ton of applications. We are, you know, for example, we are building an ADAS stack. Qualcomm is getting into the business of developing an autonomous driving stack, a safety stack, something that you would say, what's a smartphone company uh, 
doing building a stack. Well, we are no longer just a smartphone company. We are also you know, going kind of in that direction. We are engaged with uh, various ecosystem partners from SaaS, you know, you'll hear about Salesforce, you'll hear about something we're doing with JP Morgan uh, to be able to go uh, open up the platform for SaaS partners and automakers to be able to bring differentiators onto the platform. Uh, the cockpit is changing completely. You will see from us how Gen AI is actually ready on our platforms for uh, 2024. We have uh, silicon that is in commercial vehicles, in production vehicles in 24. Uh, that is uh, ready for Gen AI. It's a software update and that's done. So for us, this is one of those things where you really have to be able to uh, look at all of the assets that you have in place, have a long-term strategy, and then have the customer base trust you to be able to go implement that platform. First of all, I'm glad you pointed out the diversification. Um, you know, it's important you reiterate that often. I can say as an analyst, I've been talking to, the, to both the street and to the market uh, about Qualcomm's diversification, and I think the message is starting to, to land. Um, I think just last week I was on, on CNBC and I was talking to them. They were actually asking about your XR and the innovation, which I, by the way, expect some of that XR to find its way into the CAR. Yeah, yeah. you like what yeah. I did there? Yeah. Yeah. I practiced that one earlier. Um, yeah, it was good. Um, but. I expect to see that all these technologies start to find, you know, you could start to see some of the uh, AI PC capabilities becoming part of the Gen AI inside the car because an NPU is going to find its way into the automobile and you're going to start to see, you know, and then you, you're talking about SaaS and applications, the world's converging. And I think that's, you guys call it like the connected intelligent edge or I've heard Cristiano refer to it that way. Um, it's all coming together. And so uh, I'm glad you caught that. I, I, I I'm glad you reiterated that because it's really important. But I also wanted you to reiterate a little bit about that Gen AI. I heard you say that yeah. most popular trend in 2023. Yeah. Um, in fact, I didn't have to talk about anything else to the media the entire year. Thank you. Um, but you said Gen AI is finding its way into the digital cockpit. Can you just talk a little bit more about like what yeah. that experience may look like, Nicole? Yeah, let's go back a couple of years. You know, when we started to think about uh, designing compute for the car. Uh, ADAS was very important for us. So we said, okay, you need to be able to build uh, AI for ADAS. And uh, should we build two completely different pieces of silicon or should we just build one common piece of silicon? We can use it for cockpit, we can use it for ADAS. We went with the latter decision. So the platforms that we build for the car are not uh, separate between what you put into ADAS versus what you put in the cockpit. What that allows us to do is to essentially have the hardware the headroom that you need to be able to bring in something like Gen AI, it's already built in into our cockpit solutions. It has been for like three years now. So, uh, you know, you mentioned the NPU. Uh, we overdimension uh, automotive silicon because A, we have to be able to support a much longer life cycle. Things will change, new features will come in, that's going to need more performance. But very importantly, the NPU that you highlight and other AI-related blocks, we already have that in the silicon, it's already there. In cars that will be rolling out in 24, those cars have that capability built in. So then the question is, okay, how do you use Gen AI in the car? And I'm sure you've covered this across so many different companies and so many different use cases, but the way that I think about the car is as follows. Um, it requires more than one person to be using it. The people that use the car could be different people. There could be multiple people present. The context in the car is very important because it is obviously a device that takes you from A to B. So that becomes a necessary input into what we're going to go do with Gen AI. Uh, the use cases are very broad. It's not a productivity use case. It's not a use case that is tied to uh, you know, the things that you might consider as, oh, uh, I'm uh, you know, drafting an email and please come in. It's not those things. Uh, you will see a few things that are super interesting. For example, we have virtualized the service manual for the vehicle. Uh, it is indexed through Gen AI, and you can have a conversation with your car through a network that is deployed in the vehicle. We've uh, taken uh, Llama 7 billion. That's running locally. And uh, you can now have a conversation, and uh, you can ask the vehicle questions about, uh, you know, but giving context, hey, I see a diagnostic code, I see this uh, alarm light turn on, what does it mean? And you get a response that is picked up all locally. There is no cloud involved in something like this. That's one simple example. How much time I tried to find the TP, uh, the, TM, the, the temperature, TPM. <laughs> the TPMS, my daughter's car, because yeah, every car is so different. Yes. I mean, just this weekend, yes. I was literally like yes. in the menus like for like, and I was going to YouTube, trying to find demos, and it was like even by year, 
it was different. So you, you're saying you could basically go to it, use an, 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 an natural language processing, talk to the car, say, I see the sensor, tell me yeah, what it means. Yeah, to me, you know, I think, Dan, the part that is very interesting, and all of us can relate to this because we are all, you know, we, we all experience these things every day. Uh, the idea of being able to understand how a consumer experiences the car as a product from the edge is something that automakers have always struggled with. What do people like? What do they not like? What can we change? Uh, if we can change it, how do we go change it? And one thing that is changing, first of all, because cars are becoming so software first, so digital. Uh, secondly, there is so much compute capability available. So you're not design the, designing the car for just enough hardware. There is actually plenty of room to be, to be able to do more. And then when you bring intelligence from the edge and make it available back into the cloud, and GNAI is a great tool in terms of how to go do that, it changes the way that you roll services out. And you will see that uh, there are a number of automakers that are very sophisticated technologically, that are they're very sophisticated in terms of how to go, go, go build a software product. These are things that are gonna come very naturally to them. They're just gonna think of the car as a digital product that has so much more potential. And then of course there are the traditional OEMs that have to figure out how to make this an advantage. We find ourselves situated very well because we are designing platforms that cater to both ends. We are learning very quickly from the customers that know how to move the needle, that know how to push the envelope in terms of how do I bring something that nobody else can bring as quickly as possible. Those are who we are catering, who we are designing our platforms for. And then of course we work with everybody else to make sure that we can accelerate this. So I'm super excited, especially because the timeline between when the technology can actually be converted into a product, that we have shortened. We will see that in 2024 so, so in cars. Here's, a, here's an opportunity for the industry. I believe the design cycle is too long. I don't believe people have the patience. You know, I won't, I won't speak to specifics, uh, Nicole, but I have a car that's a 2022 that actually shared the electronics with a 2012 version of the same car. I love the car, I bought it, but what I'm saying is the electronics, it's, it's an abomination that you actually have 10 year old and the cockpit was not updated. Now, if, if you're basically telling me what I think I wanna hear and what the market wants to hear is, even as cars could minimally make maybe physical designs, that re, that over, you know, and people have kind of gotten used to this with maybe like the Teslas, but other OEMs are gonna be able to follow that path of being able to dynamically overhaul cars without maybe having huge redesigns both inside, outside, cockpit, infotainment, even the software of the ADAS and the programming, cars can be completely revolutionized in a, every year, every couple of years. Is, is that where you see it going? Is the cycle gonna get much shorter to enable manufacturers to be more innovative and more quickly? I mean, clearly it is not a technology problem. Mostly the problem has to do with uh, what kind of legacy you come from, what dependencies you have built into the way that you design a platform. Uh, how separable are they? Can you build a platform that is faster moving and leave the other platforms behind? Are you a big company? Are you a small company? How, how much sharing you did? If you look at some of the very nimble automakers that we work with, they are moving at the cadence you're talking about. Every two and a half years, it's a brand new hardware upgrade, and the previous generation software works on the next generation hardware, vice versa. It is looking very much like what you might expect in consumer devices. So it's not, now obviously moving onto an EV platform makes that straightforward because it's a cleaner architecture, it's a newer architecture. When you're dealing with automakers that have uh, to manage both and, ha and that have built architectures that uh, uh, obviously uh, span both types of powertrains, there is legacy, there is complexity. So look, I, I mean, I think what you are asking for as a consumer is not lost on any automaker. The question is how quickly and with what approach do you get there? We are seeing all kinds of approaches. We are seeing automakers cordon off certain regions where they want to be able to move faster and do unique designs. We are seeing automakers pick some tiers of their vehicles and just design them differently. But everybody's going to have a slightly different approach to it because it is more than just technology that comes out of it. And a quick uh, kind of final question here, Nicole, is, you know, the alignment of kind of proprietary IP from the automaker and the, you know, custom sort of stack and capabilities, you know, I, I call it, you know, the kind of, it's not a black box. You guys have a building blocks approach. Enables them to keep kind of what's unique, quickly pair it with this, the, the Snapdragon platform for automotive. 
is that is that what you're looking to do is to basically enable all these OEMs to be able to to have their proprietary but build quickly um, so that they can stay custom but not have to go through all the pain that they've historically gone through to be custom yeah, that's actually a great question uh, a lot of the new conversations that we are having with automakers are not only what you describe which is we provide building blocks on top of which they develop theirs but where they would like to influence our building blocks or where they would like our building blocks to be modified slightly, but just for them, uh, to be uh, created very uniquely for their requirements. Uh, we are getting into conversations where uh, we are licensing some of our building blocks to automakers, and uh, some of those building blocks may actually be semiconductor agnostic because they want to be able to get a faster start. Uh, they want to be able to mix what we have with what they have and create something new from that. Uh, so, you know, the business is moving in this direction where we are becoming true partners into uh, what it will take for this chassis to change because fundamentally keep in mind that automakers have limited amount of um, the traditional automakers especially. They are learning all of these new skills very quickly, but there is still a lot of work ahead of them in terms of how to become very adept very quick. Uh, you know, uh, and I think that's where we feel like uh, we've been able to actually make a big impact with the strategy that we've had. Cool. Thanks so much for sitting down with me. Absolutely. Great to see you again. Great to see you.